million words, but how to express what I'm feeling when I see you. You flash a smile, I'm like, is this happening? I look your way and then of course drop everything. You walk over and ask if I'm alright, hey, whatever it takes to break Hi, a oh, very good evening. I hope you're all doing fine and I hope you've enjoyed the dancing molar also, right? So today we shall have this image-based discussion, a cumulative manner, right? So we'll just go through various images which I'll be projecting now. So we'll start off with the first one. Before that, a very good evening all of you. Hi. Hi, Bernice, Richa, Dhanlakshmi, Abhishek, Kedar, Gina, Brijesh, Nidhi, Preeti. Bala, Mega, Srish. Hi, Prithvi. Gina. Hi, Gina. Kedar. Hi, Kedar. Hi, Saikat Bala. Hi, Dan Lakshmi. Srish. Srish. Hi, Deepthi. A oh, very good evening. Right, so, we shall go through our first image based question, right? Yeah. So, identify the missing enzymes or the color blocks. I hope it's not very clear. Anyways, let me just zoom in. Yeah, I'll zoom in uh, for you. You can just identify these color blocks, right? So the missing enzymes. And also try to identify which cycle this image belongs to. So I hope you can see now. So identify those blue blocks which represent missing enzymes. Yes, obviously it is Krebs cycle. You can clearly see a various enzymes, right? So uh, Krebs cycle is also called as tricarboxylic acid cycle, as you know. So we have uh, various rate limiting enzymes. So whenever you're going through any uh, cycle, so always focus on the rate limiting enzymes and various factors which 
promote these enzymes and various factors which demote these enzymes in the sense which inhibit these enzymes. Yes, Richa, you asked me just few seconds ago, that's true. Okay, so this is your citric acid cycle or tricarboxylic acid cycle. So identify those missing enzymes. And these missing enzyme is considered to be a rate limiting enzyme for citric acid cycle. Yes, Pridvi, Nidhi. And also you can see uh, these enzymes are catalyzing the conversion of isocitrate to oxalosuccinate and from oxalosuccinate through decarboxylation alpha ketoglutrate is being formed. Very good. So I, 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 I'm sure you're all familiar with these cycles. Anyways, let's get back to the question once again and let's have a few uh, valid discussion pertaining to this question. So right, yeah. It is isocitrate dehydrogenase, which is considered to be a rate limiting enzyme for citric acid cycle. So along with this isocitrate dehydrogenase, there are few other enzymes that are considered to be very much essential in regulating TCA cycle, which includes citrate synthase as well as alpha ketoglutrate dehydrogenase. So these three enzymes, citrate synthase, isocitrate dehydrogenase, and alpha ketoglutrate dehydrogenase are considered to be very important enzymes which regulate TCA cycle or citric acid cycle, right? So what is a rate limiting enzyme? As I said, isocitrate dehydrogenase is considered as a rate limiting enzyme for this TCA cycle. So the activators and inhibitors for any rate limiting enzyme are very much essential. In case of your isocitrate dehydrogenase, ADP is the activator whereas ATP or NADPH are considered to be inactivators or inhibitors, right? You can just add up these points. So isocitrate dehydrogenase is activated by ADP, whereas it is inhibited by the end products, that is ATP or NADPH, right? So for every cycle, you have various rate limiting enzymes. You can refer our eight classes the key points in biochemistry where we have given you a table with various cycles and corresponding rate limiting enzymes right in case of glycolysis which is considered to be a rate limiting enzyme Good. Burnus? Yes, Prithvi, Abhishek, Anjun. Good. It is phosphofructokinase, right? Yeah. So, very good. Very impressive. Yes, Nidhi? Right. Now, let's move on to the next. So, you, you can expect uh, these schematic illustrations with missing enzymes or missing key steps. Also, we have included one or two of, uh, of these in our grant test as well, right? more to the next question. Identify the pathology. So identify the pathology which is associated in relation to the periapical area of 1, 1 and 1, 2. And let me just give you some uh, uh, clinical uh, points pertaining to this case as well. The teeth are vital, they are responding normally to various vitality tests and on uh, taking the radiograph you can see this, uh, this anomaly. So what could be this uh, finding? And as I said it is associated with 1-1 one, one and 1-2. One, as you can clearly see here. Nasal palatine duct cyst usually in the midline, isn't it? Between 1 1 and 2 1. We have discussed the same previously also. Also, I have this heart shaped radiolucency in few instances.
Okay. It's a even though the teeth are vital, uh, anyways, it's a extra radicular infection. It's a periapical cyst. Sometimes there can be periapical cyst, which is not related to the intra radicular infection. So you can have extra radicular infections which are not related to intra radicular infections. In such cases, which organisms are commonly implicated in in, in these kind of infections? So if it's an extra radicular, because in a Grossman it has this classification, intra radicular, periapical, and extra radicular infections, isn't it? So this falls under the category of extra radicular infections and which organisms are most commonly implicated in extra radicular infections. Yes, Abhishek, that's what I'm saying. You have intraradicular, periapical, as well as extra radicular. Refer extra radicular. You'll have a better understanding. Extra radicular infections. This is an extra radicular infection and it has nothing to do with intra radicular uh, pathology. Actinomyces and propionobacteria propionica. So these organisms are commonly implicated in these extra radicular infections, right? So you can refer Grossman. Also, I'll share the image in our Google group. You can refer to that at a later date, right? E. fecal is usually in uh, intraradicular infections, right? You can go through the classification of various infections, a root canal infections in Grossman. We have a classification and we have various images pertaining to it, right? So this falls under the category of extraradicular infection, which is not related to your intraradicular infection. And you know what? These are treated through periapical surgery only, right? Yeah, actinomyces species and propionobacteria propionicum. Actinomyces species and propionobacteria propionicum, P. propionicum. Right? I hope it's clear. It's a cyst. You can see the size of the lesion. We can see well-defined radiolucency, more than 1 to 1.5 centimeters, present almost or overlapping the periapical area. Yes, of course, it's a periapical cyst, which is of extra radicular type. Okay. Yes, that's what I'm saying, Ajaj. In, in these cases, in these conditions of extra radicular infections, only periapical surgery is needed. Only through periapical surgery you can treat this case. And the treatment as such is not necessary because that's not the reason for its etiology, right? And uh, refer extra radicular infections in Grossman, okay? Yeah. If you have any further questions, drop them in. But let's move on to the next one. Which a rotary system has the following cross-sectional design. Yes, number the good. I said rotary file system, which rotary file system has the following cross section.
Okay, um, flexor file, K reamer, flexor, pro taper. Good. Anything else? So as you can see, it's a triangular uh, cross section, right? But convex triangle, convex triangle, and also you can see U-shaped design incorporated in your convex triangle cross section. Yeah, this belongs to pro taper. It's a pro taper which has a convex triangular shape, and you have these finishing files F3, F4, and F5 which have these U flutes. Okay. Yeah, this is pro taper, pro taper cross sectional design. Also, you can add up it's a convex and triangular shape with sharp cutting edges and also no radial lines. So, already we have discussed in detail various parts of an uh, endodontic file. Uh, you can refer to e classes for more information where I have discussed in detail about flutes, lands, helix angle, etc. Right? So, you can see convex triangular shape, sharp cutting edges, no radial lands. F3, F4 and F5 finishing files do have these U flutes for increased flexibility and also we have a non-cutting tip for a pro taper, variable taper, pro taper in the sense progressive taper, there is no constant fixed taper, it's a progressive taper, a variable taper along the length of each instrument and pitch and helix angle are balanced to prevent instruments from screwing into the canal, right, you can refer all these terms in our classes, you'll find more information. Okay, so this represents the cross section of a pro taper instrument where you have convex triangle outline with U shaped design incorporated in your finishing files for increased or improved flexibility. Clear? Now let's move on to the next one. So identify this. Identify the image. Let me know if it's not clear. I'll zoom in. Also, mention uh, as you're rightly saying, of course, they are gutta percha, very good. So, uh, what is the size? What sizes do you see here? And what could be the taper? Because in options they give you. A 2% 15 to 40 GP, 4% 15 to 40 GP, 6% 15 to 40 GP, 4% 40 uh, to 80 uh, GP. Uh, I can have several options, right? So be more specific. Of course, these are gutta percha points. What could be the taper and what could be the sizes? Good. Wonderful. So we have standard two percent ISO standard two percent GP cones from fifteen to forty. As you can see, color coding white, yellow, red, blue, green, and black. Right? 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and forty. So. Standard GP cone sizes 15 to 40, 2 percent. Good. Now, next one. So, what does this image represent? Yes, very good. It's a casting ring, as you rightly mentioned. Sprue former. You can see a sprue. And oh, what is this structure? What is this bulbous structure called? Good. It's a reservoir, right? To provide continuous molten metal feed into your mold space. Good. And this is your single unit crown wax pattern, isn't it? So it's a casting ring with a wax pattern. 
where primary sprue is oriented directly towards the wax pattern with a reservoir, right? So casting defects and all, we have covered it previously. You can refer our A classes for more information, fine? Right. Good. Now let's move on to the next one. Now tell me the parts of what you have seen. Uh, let me just zoom in. Uh, not the movements. Uh, Meher, we, we shall have various movements later, subsequently. Tell me the various parts which you can see. Somehow, you can see only movement in this area, right? I had to zoom out. Yeah, now you can see a complete movement. Right? So these are your carpels, these are your metacarpels, proximal, intermediate, and distal phalanges, right? So carpels metacarpals, proximal phalanges, intermediate phalanges and distal phalanges, isn't it? Now, yeah, very good. Now, let's have various hand positions and also let me know which position the particular image represents. As uh, one of you rightly mentioned, uh, like, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Mm. Yes, as Meher said, Flexion. So I will have various images representing different hand positions, right? So try to identify them. So what does this position represent? So what do you call this hand position? Erection. Okay, there is also erection, but mainly it is. We shall have erection picture later. Very good. Bingo. So, Benis, you have this habit of extending your hand every time. Okay, fine. So this image represents extension of your hand, right? Anyways, we'll have a revision of the same once we complete. Don't worry. So this is your extension, right? Good. Now, to identify this position. Flexion, okay, of course you are flexing it. It has more specific name. Okay, uh, this is called as cylindrical power grasp. Cylindrical power grasp. Okay, you can just make a note of because once I share these images, I'm not going to give you uh, all these notes, right? So you can just make a note of these points so that you can compare with a soft copy at a later date. So this is cylindrical power grasp. As you can see, in case of cylindrical power grasp, the metacarpophalangeal joint and interphalangeal joints are flexed. Right? So metacarpophalangeal and interphalangeal joints, they are flexed. And radiocarpal joints are extended. So radius and ulna, radiocarpal joints are, you can see here, they are extended comparatively, right? You can just do these movements and feel. Radiocarpal joints are extended. Fine. So without a wrist extension, the grip is considered to be weak and insecure. Without extending the uh, wrist, if you put the wrist uh, in this position, without extending it, if you flex it, then there won't be any power grasp. But once you extend it, then you can feel that or you can have a tight secure or tight hold through 
to this power cylindrical grass right very simple so this represents cylindrical power grass where you can see metacarpophalangeal and interphalangeal metacarpophalangeal is meta uh, metacarpal bones and phalangeal joints right so this junction and also interphalangeal is between the phalanges so the joints are completely flexed and also there is extension of your ulna carpal or radiocarpal joints so extension of radiocarpal joints and flexion of metacarpophalangeal and interphalangeal joints in case of your cylindrical power grasp fine so what does this represent seems to be like the same as that of previous one isn't it so what do you call uh, this kind of uh, holding or this position okay well try just observe this picture carefully we have a more or less similar picture in the next slide also and let's try to have a comparison between these two images <laughs> thin cylinder nidhi okay fine so i hope you have observed it carefully right you can see all the positions and all now observe the next image so this is your second image the previous one and this there are uh, subtle differences very minor so i'll get back to the previous one again right so this is the first image and this is the second image yes you can see some tilting right so the first one is called as loose cylindrical grasp loose l o o s e loose cylindrical grasp whereas the second one is tight cylindrical or firm cylindrical grasp firm very firm cylindrical grasp where you can see the fourth and fifth metacarpophalangeal joints being moved in the palmar direction right so in the previous one in the loose cylindrical grasp the metacarpophalangeal joints appear to be normal but in the next image as you can see the fourth and fifth metacarpophalangeal joints are moving in the direction or they are flexed towards the direction of your palm isn't it so the former one the first one is loose cylindrical grass the next one is firm cylindrical grass very simple right so more or less these are all cylindrical grasps yes yes then lakshmi good next so this is centralized grasp centralized centralized power grasp like holding a screw drive centralized power grasp and this is your like when you are trying to open a, a mouth of a bottle or of a cylinder this is called as disc power grasp disc 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 grasp okay and what do you call this holding a bag grasp holding grasp okay holding power grasp so now we started with your own name good it's called as hook hook grasp h o o k hook h o o k hook grasp so this hook grasp involves primarily the long flexors of fingers you have flexors here so when you hold when you hook on to something the long flexors of your fingers are activated and the degree of flexion depends upon the weight of the object which you are lifting uplifting grasp 
Wonderful. So you're all coming up with your own terminology. Maybe we can start a book soon. So this is hook grasp. And so what is this? So assume that this is a lemon slice. Assume that it's a lemon slice. So you're holding a lemon delicately. So what do you call this? Come on, I'm waiting. <laughs> I was expecting the dancer, Richard. Fingertip pinch. Fingertip P I N C H. Fingertip pinch. Yeah, it's considered to be a soft, delicate grass. Fingertip pinch. Right? And final one, which you're all familiar with. So identify this position. Yes, Prashanti. Pen grass. It's pencil, right? You don't have eraser here. No, it's not pen grass. Where do you find pen here? Tomesh, Manasi, you're following the lecture very well. Good. Okay, this is your tripod. Tripod effect, right? So it's called as tripod pinch. The previous one is fingertip pinch this is tripod pinch tripod pinch okay okay fine good so you should have a revision of all the images which we have discussed so far and then we'll conclude right Yes, Manasi, tripod effect for greater stability. Yes, which we use in our upholding your hand scalers and all various hand instruments, even for sharpening and all. You'll have better dexterity and also, uh, since the pads of your fingers are in touch, there will be a better tactile sensitivity also. Good. I mean, in fact, Bernice, uh, we find tripoding effect in case of your modified pen grasp, isn't it? So maybe you can consider modified pen grasp as your tripod pinch, right? Yes. Yes, you have tripoding effect. Uh, also, uh, my camera stand, so we have tripoding effect for greater stability. Good. So identify this image. Okay. Right, but before this, I wanted to actually ask you one uh, question. Anyways, I have one image which I'll project at the end of this lecture, right? So before that, we'll try to complete off all this. So this is your, so what is this? Dancing molar, dancing and brushing molar, right? So we have projected an illustration of the citric acid cycle. So I have blocked two enzymes here. So you can have these kind of questions as well. And the enzyme which is missing is isocitrate dehydrogenase, which is considered to be a rate limiting enzyme. Now, next. So this is an extra radicular infection. I just wanted to uh, discuss regarding various microorganisms responsible for extra radicular infections. That's the reason why I projected this image. And also clearly, as you can see, it's a cyst. It's a periapical cyst. 
and extra infections, etiology, it's actinomyces species or propionobacterium propionicum where surgical intervention is necessary, right? Next, so this is a cross-section illustration of a protaper where you can see convex, it's a triangular outline, right? So convex triangle, you can see convex uh, triangle outline and also there can be U-shaped uh, flutes or U-shaped design incorporated in your finishing files for improved flexibility. These are your gut aperture points, standardized 2% gut aperture points from 15 to 40 size. Very simple, isn't it? So also go through your endo textbook where you can find 4% as well as 6% GP points. So this is your casting ring with sprue former, right? So casting ring with wax pattern where you can see primary sprue attach it and also you can find the reservoir here. So various parts of your hand, carpels, metacarpals, proximal, intermediate and distal phalanges, right? Okay. So this image represents flexion or extension. So this is your flexion, this is your extension, right? So this image represents extension of your hand. This is your cylindrical power grasp. Loose cylindrical grasp. Firm cylindrical grasp, where you can see the movement of this fourth and fifth uh, metacarbophalangeal joints towards the palmar side. And this is your central centralized centralized power grasp. Disc. You're trying to remove this disc power grasp. Hook H O O K. Hook grasp. Fingertip pinch. Tripod pinch. And as I said, uh, we have, we still have two more images. So what does each position represent here? I see. I hope it's clear. So what does this represent? The first one on the left. Uh, yeah, obviously 4% and I, I mean it might be difficult for you to identify and differentiate 2 and 4% in an image but obviously they appear to be more bulkier as uh, Kaiser rightly mentioned. Good. So the first one is extended. Okay. It represents extension of your uh, fingers. The second one is flexion. So this represents flexion. The third one represents abduction, A, B, D, U, C, T, I, O, N, abduction. And this represents adduction. Adduction is medial movement, right? And the final one is opposed to little finger, your thumb opposed to little finger. Okay, I'll just repeat once again. So this is your extension, flexion, abduction, adduction and this final one is your opposed to thumb opposing your little finger. So these are various hand positions. Fine? Yes, very simple. And we'll stop with this one general image. So who is going to identify this correctly? So identify this wonderful uh, place. The last image is opposed to, opposed to your thumb opposing to little finger. Yes, Nidhi says Kashmir, Parichai, Dal Lake, Angel, Hawaii. Mauritius
Yes, of course it is the lake, India. So we have many beautiful places in India also. And even ours is a very beautiful place. Uh, you have fields in the backdrop. You can definitely visit our place once. Yes, it's a yeah, it's Dalmi. Fine. I hope you enjoyed this session. I hope you got some valid points as well. And also, uh, there is nothing uh, more for me to speak in regard to preparation. I've been talking a lot uh, in form of various videos. 30 days before NEET, 20 days before NEET, and final preparation strategy before NEET. So please go through all those videos. And if you have any further queries, drop a mail. And I've been getting a few mails today, uh, like uh, one of our aspirants was selected for this uh, Public Service Commission, uh, Neetu Sharma. Uh, she has dropped a mail. I'm so happy for her and congratulations, Neetu. I, I think you're not online. Okay. And also, we have been getting a few uh, positive feedbacks regarding our test series and e-classes, which is really very good to see. And that really adds up to our energy and uh, happiness levels as well. Right? And you have any further queries, drop them in and wish you all the best. So Abhishek has stayed in, a, in that boat for a night. Abhishek, we are, we are planning to visit that place and I will definitely contact you Abhishek. Yes, 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 I am from Andhra Pradesh, uh, Preeti, I am from Andhra, Vijayawada is my uh, uh, birthplace, yes. <laughs> okay, I know Bernice are very sharp, <laughs> anyways. We'll see you again tomorrow with key points, right? So tomorrow's session, uh, we'll have, in fact, I'm, uh, I'm naming these MCQ discussions as key points. I'll change their names, but tomorrow as such, we'll be having discussion of only key points. I'll be going through a list of various important points in all subjects. You can either make a note of them or uh, you can just listen and you can uh, uh, watch them later. So we'll have this kind of uh, key point discussion tomorrow, right? So we have any further queries? always drop a mail yes okay so abhishek says uh, these are like five star hotels from inside good abhishek definitely i'll contact you soon thank you so much uh, angel angela is asking where is toffee toffee is currently holidaying in hyderabad we'll have toffee soon Uh, Toffee is celebrating her new year in Hyderabad. Okay, great. I'll see you tomorrow at 8 p.m. again. I wish you all the best. Love you. Bye. Yes, definitely we'll have Toffee before exam. That's for sure. Yes, Manasi, it's 8 p.m. as usual. Drop a mail, Manasi, we'll send you our live session schedule, right? So Monday to Friday, we'll be having live sessions at 8 p.m. Brijesh, if you want toffee, I'm sorry, I can't give you toffee. I can only show you toffee. Yes, Abhishek, I'll definitely share all these images in our Google group, right? Yeah. Yes. Bye. Pokojo. And we are missing Regina Bernas. <laughs> okay, bye. Good night.